Hey, it's Andrew Claven with this week's interview with both Kevin Sorbo and Rick Schroeder, sometimes called Ricky Schroeder, two terrific actors who are doing excellent work fighting back against the incredibly decayed uh, culture of Hollywood. I got a phone call about a week ago from a friend of mine, a successful uh, Hollywood worker. I don't want to identify him too much, but he is a guy in the movie business who does very well. And he told me an interesting story. He said, you know, when you talk in public, when people talk in public about the films that came out this year, they all talk about Barbie and Oppenheimer. But behind uh, closed doors, the only movie they talk about is Sound of Freedom, the Jim Caviezel thriller with a real Christian bent. And he said they all just want to know how do they reach that audience? How do they uh, do, do the kinds of things that that film did? Because that film made over $100 million and circumvented the Hollywood distribution monopoly with the help of Angel Studios. This is, as you will know if you've been listening to my show, this is an amazing moment. Hollywood is hurting. The woke storytelling, the leftist p propaganda is only really word for it, and the blacklist against anybody who disagrees with wokeness or leftism uh, has really hurt their bottom line and has left an opening for storytellers who are willing to go off the grid and do stuff that's original and different. And these are two actors that I wanted to talk to specifically because they're doing it. Uh, you all know Kevin Sorbo, I'm sure. He was Hercules back in the day. Uh, also, he was in the incredibly uh, popular Christian film, God's Not Dead. And, and by the way, I think films like God's Not Dead have created the audience, helped create the audience that has made films like uh, Sound of Freedom possible and has made this, created this market, basically. And Rick Schroeder, of course, uh, won the Golden Globe Award. He's the youngest recipient, I think, of the Golden Globe Award for The Champ. He was in one of my favorite TV shows, NYPD Blue. But he's also produced uh, and actually directed films like Black Cloud, the anthology film Locker 13, which I also enjoyed very much. Guys, it's it's great to see you. It's great to have you here. Thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Good to be here. So let, let's just start by talking. I'll start with you, Kevin, because you've been in uh, in the sort of Christian uh, filmmaking field. Do you, have you suffered basically for for who you are, for what you believe in Hollywood? Or I mean, it looks like look, you know, God's Not Dead films like that are so successful. I don't want to talk about you suffering like you know, like terrible suffering. But really, have you paid a price for that in Hollywood? Oh, no, no question. No question. Hollywood loves me. Um, uh, I think I think I'm the original cancel culture victim with, with my agent of many, many decades. And uh, my manager called me into their offices about 10, 11 years ago and said, we can't work with any longer. It was like an intervention of sorts. And I had to laugh at it because I said, you know, you guys are the ones you're the industry that always screams for tolerance and freedom of speech. But we all know it's hip. They're hypocrites. It's all a one way street with them. So. Um, I formed SorboStudios.com to do my own independent movies. I love the industry, just like Ricky does. We love what we do. We love the creation. I love the creative process on both sides of the camera. I actually started directing back in my Hercules years. So that's always been a big part of my life. So um, my first really unapologetically faith-based movie is actually called What If? And it's from the same writers that did God's Not Dead. I've shot over 80 movies. What If in my book? is a much better movie than God's Not Dead, but it also shows you when independent movies, as Rick knows, we don't have a $100 million advertising budget for a, 300, for a $3 million movie. So how do you get it out there? You need strong word of mouth. Well, God's Not Dead benefited from that. What if, written by the same guys, Chuck and Carrie, they recently came out with Nefarious. They did Unplanned a few years ago as well. Great writers. It was directed by Dallas Jenkins, who's now doing The Chosen, which is like massive around the world. So. Yeah. Um, I've been very blessed to kind of keep down that road and do movies that Hollywood used to do. They don't have to be faith based, but Hollywood used to do movies that had hope, had love, had redemption, had laughter in them. The good guy wins. They don't do that anymore. Uh, I think the 60s changed all that. Uh, they started celebrating the, the evil. They started celebrating the anti-hero, but it's just gotten worse each decade. And it's just crazy. I'm going to keep doing these movies and uh I didn't need Hollywood. It's fine. I, they owe me nothing, and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. It's, it, it is amazing. It's, it, it goes beneath the radar because nobody covers it. Nefarious was a really good film. I mean, it was really creative yeah. and just takes place basically in one room with two characters, and yet was was riveting. It's terrific. Uh, Rick, you, you actually are more openly conservative. I mean, you're both conservatives, but you've kind of been, you haven't been centered in a Christian filmmaking. You've been talking about uh, your conservative ideas, and you also, during the uh, COVID shutdowns, were very outspoken. And I remember people saying this was con controversial, is the word they always use when they disagree with you. And I was thinking, I don't say it was controversial about being against these shutdowns. But uh, do you feel that you have had to move uphill and move 
against the wind because of your opinions or or not? Yes, absolutely. Um, never quite fit in in Hollywood. You know, I I never really kind of felt like a, an actor there. Actually, I felt always like an asset there. Um, I never quite was invited to all the the clubs and the the cool parties. And so, um, you know, that's why I started Real American Heroes. I started this nonprofit because the diversity, equity and inclusion guidelines at the Academy. I became an Academy member when I was, I think, eight years old and <laughs> A few years ago, they changed the guidelines so that you um, you couldn't be eligible for the best picture category for the Oscar if you didn't have LGBTQ plus characters, themes of your story, uh, is, is your that, crew had to be. Wait, is that right? Is that right? You cannot be eligible for the best film? best picture. I did not. Know yeah. That. And so they they totally, you know, art is free. It's always supposed to be free. Um, it's never supposed to be controlled. You're supposed to be able to say what you want. Um, hire who you want, work with who you want. Um, you don't have to hire um, who they say you have to hire, but that's what the Academy has done. Um, these DEI requirements. And it really offended me. And I decided Hollywood had fallen at that point. And uh, I needed to still, I still want to tell stories and still work and do stuff. So I had a vision to create Patriot PBS is what we want to create. We want to create an, a, a PBS alternative where we become an aggregator for everybody else's stories. And we start putting out pro proper programming because everybody's getting programmed out there by what they listen to, what they watch, what they hear. And so we need to sort of turn around the programming. And, you know, as Kevin mentioned earlier, you know, back in the old, the old days, black and white film era, I love watching black and whites today. Yeah. The characters always did the right things. They had morals, they had standards, they had values. And then the anti-hero, like Kevin mentioned, came into existence and, you started having all these very flawed characters. Um, you know, I was watching Titanic the other day with my girlfriend and you think about the characters involved, you know, they're not honorable people. They're, they're betraying each other. They're lying behind each other's backs. They're uh, trying to seduce each other when one's engaged. It's, it's like this, you know, it's, it's, we, we celebrate that kind of, you know, moral decline you know, idols in the Bible. I was reading the Bible today and idols. It says, stay away from idols. We don't want idols. Well, you think about American Idol now the show and you think about Survivor, the reality show that's that changed television. The goal is to get the idol, you know, to win the idol. To So, you know, they, they use our words against us. They go into the Bible and they try to confuse people. But um so when you want to build the, the, the big thing, people, people don't know this if they're not in the business. It's, it's, it's one thing to make a movie. It's one thing to make a show. The thing is to get it seen. I mean, that is an incredibly hard thing to do. And the distribution paths, the paths to distribute it to people are, are blocked. I mean, they're very, uh, they're very much dominated by the left and by the Hollywood mainstream. So I want to know, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to you, Kevin, first. But like when you say you're making these films, how do you get them out there? How do you get them from the place where you are in an editing room, you know, cutting up the picture until it works, and then you've got a picture? Where do you go? Well, there's a couple of distribution outlets that I like to use. They don't have the creative accounting that most of Hollywood does, um, where they'll cheat you out of anything. I used to joke with my old manager. I said, you know, I don't know why they call it a back end deal because I, now I figured out you basically take it in the back end. I mean, that's <laughs> what they do. It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And I, I, can say, I remember one time I said, you know, Hercules was largely successful. In fact, by our third year, we were the most watched show in the world in 176 countries. They did that show for seven years. You can talk to any television producer. If you're going into your third and fourth year in TV series, you're making money. There's a lot more money in TV than there is in movies. And um, I just said, why do I have to shoot for my back end? Why, why didn't they just tell the truth? He goes, well, it's just part of doing business in Hollywood. And I went, what? So they're, it, they're like, they're all locked into this thing where it's okay to lie, cheat, and deceive each other. Um, I remember going to some of these premier movies with all these A-listers around. I remember turning to my wife, Sam, I said, I said, do you feel a desperation in this room? Because you can feel it. And I agree with Rick. I've never, I never felt like a Hollywood guy. That's why I lived in Thousand Oaks. I want to be near enough, but far enough away from it all, you know, and it's the, the biggest thing with getting movies made. Number one is just get them funded. I mean, my movies are in the 3 million range. That sounds like a lot of money. 
That's catering budget in Pirates of the Caribbean. Those are massive movies. And then how do we get it out there? Because we don't have that big budget movie. We got to do what we can. We got to reach out to anybody and everybody. There's 80 million homes in America that want the kind of product I do. Look, I did a movie called Let There Be Light that Sean Hannity funded. Did very well. Uh, $2.3 million budget movie opened number two per screen average against Thor Ragnarok, a $300 million movie. I get a call from Netflix on Monday after opening weekend. I said, hey, you have a foot in this inspirational world. We want to open an inspiration division here at Netflix. I had three, four meetings with them over the next like seven, eight weeks. Ultimately, they did nothing. It was all just lip service. Their ideology is so filled with hate and anger towards someone like me and and and, and Rick. I mean, it, it, being a Christian and a conservative is like being a double leper in Hollywood. But you know, I just I'm doing what I can to get it out there. I had two movies in theaters last year, but you know, they weren't out there very long because they didn't have a big following. But uh, we don't have the big advertising budget. I mean, but they're wonderful movies, wonderful stories, and it's 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 unfortunate. And now through my through Sorbo Studios. Dot com, I get people going, hey, I just saw your movie, um, you know, Left Behind, Rise of the Antichrist. It's awesome. You know, I go, well, spread the word because we yeah. need word of mouth. You know, Rick, I was thinking when you said you wanted to make a, a, a patriotic PBS, I mean, th- that's the kind of thing like I might wake up at three o'clock in the morning and think that was a good idea. But the next thought would be like, how, where do you even start? How do you start to do that? I mean, PBS is obviously partly gun- government funding. It's got all these channels. How, where do you begin? Well, you know how you eat an elephant, right? <laughs> One spoonful at a time. <laughs> so okay. you just gotta yeah. you just gotta put one step in front of the other. You gotta create some content that's that's people wanna see, number one. And so once you have some content they wanna see, you, you know, there's there, it it'll find its way. Look look like you said, um that one film just the the one you were mentioned earlier, um yeah, Sound of Freedom the children um being trafficked. Look how they did it. I mean, they did it one step at a time. They were hey, able Ricky, to we shot that five years ago. It took that long to get it going. Yeah. So you can't you can't worry about what's down the road. You just got to do what's in front of you and take it one bite at a time. And so we're just starting right now producing a documentary series called Erotic Erosion. That's going to look at the decline of the standards and values of our society since the rise of Internet pornography. If you really think about it, the camera before the camera was invented. The only way you can engage in perversion was to engage it, a see, a, a, experience perversion was to engage in it yourself or to witness mm. it. Once the camera was invented 150 years ago, you could d- now distribute it. And so we, we sort of are, are looking at sort of since the genesis of the camera, how perversion has been disseminated into everybody's homes and their minds through this you know, device. And so um, erotic erosion is a documentary series looking at the decline of of our society after 45 years of internet porn. Are you aware that when internet porn first came out, it was in the .xxx URL, and so it was easily to block at your house because you could put a, a URL blocker. Well, then a lot of the church leaders of the day were offended that there was such thing as a .xxx URL, so they had it shut down. And all that pornography went to the dot com world Mm. where you can no longer block it. So we, you know, we have five goals at the Council on Pornography Reform, which is one of our our missions. And one of them is to put all adult content back into the triple X URL. And then another thing we want is we want an off switch. Americans love choice, right? Freedom of choice, they say. Freedom of choice. Well, we want the choice to have adult content turned off to our devices and to our homes. Um, you know, if you pay the bill to AT&T or Verizon, there's absolutely no reason you have to have this push to your, your, your family and to your house. Um, and so, you know, that's easily doable for them. There's no such thing as internet pornography in many countries around the world. And so they can actually shut it down. So with erotic erosion, our documentary series, we'll be talking to experts about the first amendment, for example, and how the first amendment was uh, written to protect freedom of speech against um, political opposition. You could say what you wanted against the government and not be afraid, right? That's why. But then they changed uh, freedom of speech. They defined it as freedom of expression. It doesn't say that in the Constitution. It says freedom of speech. But freedom of expression then included pictures because that's a form of expression the Supreme Court ruled. Mm-hmm. And now pornography was covered under the First Amendment. So 
you know, just because we've been duped by by this this world doesn't mean we have to stay duped by by this world's you know these politicians. And so we have some goals at CPR, Council on Pornography Reform, that we're going to be focused on in the Erotic Erosion series to try to push uh, these ideas because we want Americans to come together, all of us, as far as on this issue, um, protecting our kids and doing age yeah. verification and you know AI. And if we get a win for we the people, Andrew. And we can get energy behind this kind of reform and show that our government can work for our families, then maybe there's a government worth saving. And, and it's a government then that we can we can unite all those people in that energy and move into the next issue, which is like balanced budget amendment. We're all getting poorer in this country. So because you're going to you're, gonna, you're fa- focusing on issues. And, and do you think you have a, a lane to distribute? Well, yeah, I mean, we have our own platform to put it up. It's, it's, we can oh, distribute. Too. Okay, okay. The, the, the question is, can you get it can seen? You, can you promote it? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Because we can get it out there, yeah. but you have to get people to know about it. Beam's Dream Powder. I love this stuff. It knocks you right out. It really helps you sleep. It contains a powerful, all natural blend of ingredients, including magnesium L theanine. I have to be honest, I don't even know what that is, but it surely does put you to sleep. I used it, it works. It's not just your run of the mill sleep aid, it's a concoction carefully crafted to help you slip into the sweet embrace of rest without the grogginess that often accompanies other sleep remedies. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health. I wouldn't know, obviously. You must have a constant nighttime routine to function at your best. Today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors. And they really do taste good. Cinnamon cocoa, chocolate peanut butter, mint chip, better sleep has never tasted better. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth. I personally use that frothy machine just because I thought it was so much fun. You can enjoy it before bedtime. If you find yourself battling the bedtime blues, give it a shot. Your weary self will thank you. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of their New Year's sale for 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash Clavin with my promo code Clavin for up to 40% off your order if, and only if, you know how to spell Claven. There are no E's. I just make it look this easy. There are no E's in Claven. You know, Kevin, when you mentioned Netflix, I, I was thinking, the, the other day I saw on Apple TV, I saw a Mark Wahlberg comedy action film with Bridget Monaghan. And, and it was, it was kind of cute, you know, it made me laugh and, and it was, had very good family values. I know Wahlberg is a good, you know, strong family guy and, and Christian yep. guy. And I, and I've seen other things on Apple, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, submarine movie where he played this actual Bible reading, praying, uh, you know, leader, commander of a submarine. I was sitting there with my eyes. My eyes were like saucers. I, was, I couldn't believe I was actually watching it. But Apple TV seems to have opened up a little bit of a lane for that kind of content, they they also have a uh, a film that looks a little bit like um, Band of Brothers about the Flyboys in World War II, which I'm that that to me is like heroin. I'm like going to watch every minute of that probably twice. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is when they see a film like Sound of Freedom make a hundred million dollars, you know when 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 Gibson made Passion of the Christ and he basically took money out of his pocket and and yeah. made you know, so much money. They did start all these faith-based little uh, enclaves within the big studios, but they seem to be unable to turn out things that people who actually had faith wanted to watch. So they would make a film about Moses and then come out and say Moses was a terrorist, or they'd, you know, they'd make, they'd make all these films that kind of insulted the people who were supposed to see them. Is there a lane or do we have to reinvent Hollywood? Do we have to make something completely different? Well, Hollywood, I think, needs to wake up. I don't know what it takes to wake up. I mean, look at Disney. Walt Disney said back in the 1950s that movies and television will influence our youth. Well, hello. Um, I think he's flipping his brave right now what Disney has done to his name uh, because these aren't the type of movies he wants to put out. I, I, I'm sure it's more money than this. I heard a $1.4 billion loss for them last year. So how many how many more years they want to keep doing that, I don't know. I mean, I, I heard they're going to redo... Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, and they want to have a diverse cast in that. They're redoing. What's the other one they're looking at? I mean, it's, uh, Wizard, uh, of Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. That's yeah. right. So I'm looking at this going, are you kidding me? You guys are doing this? <laughs> it's 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 
it, it's it's just strange what they're doing and why they're doing it. And I, I don't know if they're going to wake up to the fact. Look, look what they did to the movie Noah with Russell Crowe. I got invited to the Paramount release of that. They had, it was it was on the lot at Paramount. And God's Not Dead had just come out and was doing amazingly well. I mean, that $2 million movie made $140 million. It's crazy. And so we're sitting there watching this. My wife looks over at me halfway through the screening is because number one, they made Noah like a schizophrenic, alcoholic, hell bent and killing his family at the end of the journey. And then my wife says, this isn't the story of Noah. It's Waterworld meets Transformers. Is what it is. <laughs> and that's what they did with it. Yeah. And at the end of the movie, the guy that only probably the only faith based producer on the set came out and he said, because people were going crazy in this movie. What are you doing in this movie? He said, well, number one, they hired an atheist. In a land that's run by a, quite a few of the people from that in they're Jewish, why would they hire an atheist person to do an Old Testament, you know, story that's as popular as no? It makes no sense to me. And then somebody asked them, not knowing I was there, I was back in the middle, like forty rows back. Guy says, "Well, why doesn't Hollywood do more independent movies like God's Not Dead? Look at the success of that movie." And he says, well, we'll leave the independent movies to the independent people out there. We're going to keep doing the big blockbusters. So he didn't really answer the question. But um, I don't know when they're going to wake up. I mean, it's weird that you have to keep pounding them over the head with the success of Sound of Freedom. And they helped that, by the way, when Hollywood came out and basically said, wait a minute, we're for child sex trafficking. We're, we're, this <laughs> movie that, just, that just made more people go want to see the movie. On both sides of the political aisle, because I most I think most people, left or right, is against having sex with five year olds. It's just that uh, you know it, it hurt them, but it helped the movie quite a bit. You know, I went and saw a screening of it at the Museum of the Bible in Washington D.C. Sure. And I looked around and I thought, why is everybody here a Christian? <laughs> Doesn't every isn't everybody against this? But apparently not, and it's certainly not in Hollywood, uh, where they famously are are uh, you know are doing things like this. I, I guess I'm really interested in in systems. To be honest with you, like I, I mean this this idea, you know, Rick, you you talked about putting material up, and I, I think this porn subject is huge. I think it's a an absolutely destructive force. And as you say, you know, it's one thing if there was a magazine behind a counter where you have to go up and shame yourself to buy a magazine. But when all you have to do is press a button on your phone, it's a it's a much, much different force in our. Andrew, and, Andrew, I remember when I was a kid, 7-Eleven got girly magazines and yeah. I was like maybe 10 years old and I couldn't believe they were behind, you know, the, they were behind the cash register. And then a couple of years later, they moved to the aisle like yeah. where now you can actually access them. And then. Internet porn came out and uh, I saw my first pornography image at nine. Hmm. Wow. Wow. And you know, that was prior to the Internet. Well, did you but, have problems? You know, I, I don't want to I don't want to get too personal, but I mean, you were a child star. And one of the famous things that they talk about, at child stars are always in danger. Did you feel that you were in danger? Yes, really? I didn't. I mean, I, didn't, I, I, I knew I couldn't trust uh, a lot of people around me. Yeah. From a, from a young age. You know, so yeah, I, I I was around some pretty unsavory characters for sure. Yeah, because because Hollywood really is a. I mean, it's funny. I mean, there are plenty of nice people in Hollywood, and it's not a monolithic uh, structure. But this is one of the things about it that is absolutely. You know, you know, I, I I wrote a fantasy novel with that, and at the core of it, there was some child trafficking in Hollywood, and I sent it to my agent. It was very popular because I put it out as a podcast here at the Daily Wire, and it did really well. And I sent it to my agent and he said, this is not what Hollywood is like. I was like, yes, it is. I mean, everybody knows. Everybody knows that it is. But I want to know, I want to know how you guys are thinking about the systems. Because it's like I said, it's one thing to make content. And if you're making documentary content, you can fund that. And if you have $3 million, you can make a movie if you can raise that. But, but how do you get to that next stage where people can see it, where people know it exists? I mean, like... I read about you guys, and I'm, I'm always following this because I think that this is the moment. This is the moment when you can actually do something like this and, and make it work because people are so sick of what they're seeing. So, so are there people that you go to? I mean, do you have people? You know, let me start with you, Rick. Is there are, are there is there a network of people that you can go to that say we're going to help you, we're going to fund this, or do you just set out on down Hollywood Boulevard with a <laughs> tin, tin cup? You know. <laughs> No, I don't have a network right now. It's all self-funded. Wow. It's all self-created, self-generated, yeah. self-distributed, self, I mean, 
pretty much promoted. Yeah. So no, I don't have a, uh, and I, and intentionally, I don't need sort of a network right now. I can do th- certain things on my own as I need other assets to come on board. I will reach out, but you know, sometimes the people that you bring into your network can influence things. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a lot of trust for a lot of folks. Mm. And so it's better just sort of to do things myself when I can. And then, and then, but I do need to learn to find partners to work with. Yeah, because you can't really make movies alone, right? No, I mean, you find crew for sure. You hire people. But I'm talking about, you're talking about like distribution partners. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have them yet, but I will search for them when I, when I need to find them. Or I'll call Kevin. Say, Kevin. <laughs> for distribution. Hey, um, Kevin, does streaming, does streaming change anything? I think it's it's here to stay, obviously. So it's another avenue. You're talking about funders out there. Look, I'm always looking for funders. I, I'm i got my golf hat on. I'm a big golfer. I do a lot. I get invited, that whole celebrity thing. I get invited to a lot of charity events. And I golf with these very wealthy people. Then you find out they're like-minded like me. They're like, oh, wow, the downfall of America. The, you know, we're Christian, we're conservatives. And then you sit there and talk to them about the movies I do. And we're talking, some of you guys are billionaires. And when I, like, when I say three million bucks to rent a movie, they're making that much every day on a couple billion dollars that they're worth. But they, ah, it's not something I do. Well, we have a culture battle going on. Right now, Hollywood is kicking our butt. They really are. They're controlling a lot of things. I know there's a tipping point in there. I know people that are out there, like, you know, what, what Rick is doing, what I'm doing, what the Irwin brothers are doing. There are people out there making good movies and good product. And we just got to keep doing that and keep fighting that fight. I get stopped all the time through airports, hotel lobbies, and people say, hey, keep making the movies you're making. And I go, well, then keep supporting it any way you can. Yeah. Because we need that. We need that help. I don't have a I don't have a faucet I can turn on and make these movies. I've got great scripts, but it's hard to sit there and raise the money for them. Wow. Um, I certainly know people I can go to for distribution, but I think for me, the first important thing to me is just get money to make these scripts. Wow, that that's that is really interesting. I mean, because I know, I, look here at the Daily Wire. This was our mission from the beginning, but we had to build it up by doing political commentary because that, you know, unfortunately, I think that that's a, it's just a lot easier, it's cheaper to do, but it's also there's this audience kind of that eats it up. But but it is it's just fascinating to me. It just if you take Fox News, Fox News comes out and it takes over half the country, basically. It becomes this major, major threat to this monolithic news industry, and yet nobody imitates it. It, it, takes, it. it takes years, decades before anybody says, oh, let's make an OAN, let's make a, even a Daily Wire, let's make all these different things, where the audience was obviously there. I sometimes wonder, I mean, is there a streaming service for Christian films? There is not. And I wish there was an app for that as well, to reach out to people, because I mean, you know, I look, I got a couple million people on Twitter alone. Can't I, why can't I get a dollar from each one of them? I don't yeah. know. It'd yeah. be great, you know, because right there, well, there's some money to get, get two million bucks gets me into 1500 screens on a, you know, on a weekend. So um, it's, it's, it's weird to try to fight it and get it out there, but uh, I'm going to keep battling because I love it. Like I said, I love what I do and I'm not going to give up the fight. So um, build it, they will come. It's kind of my attitude. You got to build something worth and then they'll come. Yep. Uh, that's I, I've kind of lived by that too. I mean, I just make the stuff, and I've, I've been really fortunate finding audiences for it. But it's it has gotten it has gotten w- wicked out there. I mean, the stuff with the DEI and the equity and the, and the it, well, it's racism. Let's call it what it is. I mean, yeah. that that stuff is just really um, it's it's ill. It's a sickness, obviously. Well, listen, I'm I'm really glad to talk to you. It kind of gives me a, a hope to talk to you. It's it's a it's a it's an interesting moment. Let me. I've only got a couple of minutes. Let me ask each one of you: Is is this a good time, or am I kidding myself? I, I see like a break in the culture. I see the the kind of rainbow coalition on its back feet. A, am I wrong about that, Rick? Do you think that there's an opening here? I do think there's an opening. I do think we're making progress. I do think we're talking about the Lord again, and you know, people aren't afraid to talk about the Lord, and so. I think that makes a difference. I, th- I think we're sick of what we see. So many Americans, we're just tired of it, of it, of it, and them pushing their perversion upon us and into us. So we we want to uh, we want to make some change, and we want to use our documentaries and our stories to help drive that change because politics is downstream of of what we do, yeah. and they, they're just kind of they follow a lot. And and you know yeah. Hollywood is sort of like the seems to me that. 
the brain of, 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 of their perversion. It's like the center of, of <laughs> Satan's messaging tools. Yeah, no question um, about it. Yeah. Ka- you know, Kevin, in so many ways. And, Kevin, are you hopeful? I, I am. You know, I, I, every set I've been on, you know, I still, I've been managing, thank God, through other independent people coming to me to say, hey, do you want to be in my movie? And I read the script and the role or whatever. I like the message. Yeah, then I'm in it. So I've been shooting four movies a year on average, the last seven, eight years. And every movie I do now, I get at least one person, sometimes more, whether it's a camera guy, another actor, whatever, pull me along, you know, over the side of the studio, like we're doing a drug deal and say, hey, man, thanks for being a voice for us. And I'm going to be a voice for yourself. And that's what we need. We need people to stop being cheap. We're here to wake up the lions. And I said, look, it hurt my career in Hollywood, but then again, then hurt my career. I'm still making movies. I'm not making the big bucks I made back in the day, but I don't care. I'm doing stuff that is changing people's lives because I get through my the Sorbo Studio site. I get people every day saying I became a Christian because of your movies. Or, you know, I love what you're doing. I'm going to support you, blah, blah, blah. And it's wonderful. So I know there's a turning point here and where it's a it's a slow ship, but it is turning in the right direction. Kevin Sorbo, Rick Schroeder, both incredibly talented actors. Really nice to talk to you. Really interesting to hear. It's uh, it's in the trenches. Yeah. One more plug. One more plug. I'm yeah. doing, I, I, used to, I, I used to all these autograph shows, Comic-Cons, because of Hercules and Andromeda. But I do, I, I, I'm I doing the first faith and family con. I want to talk to Ricky about this. I'll get your information later. But go to riseupcon.com outside of Knoxville, the end of May, last weekend in May. Riseupcon.com. You can see the people that are already involved. It's a wonderful, it's actors that you'll know and recognize, like John Schneider and Dean Cain, guys that have done movies that are faith and family movies. So it's it's bring your kids, bring your family. It's not gonna be the secular world in there. It's gonna be movies with good good uh, good messages. And uh, Corbin Burnson's gonna be there as well. So riseupcon.com, check it out. All right. Last Let's thing guys- I got, Andrew, I got, Andrew, I got one more thing. Yeah. Um, w- this Valentine's Day, we're asking America to make a pledge to be porn free. Uh, and you can, go on, you can go to councilonpornreform.org and you can download the pledge and print it. And you and your partner can sign it. And we can try to start building bonds between couples again. And women can get rid of their vibrators and guys can get rid of their porn and we can come together because that's what we need. All right. I'm for it. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. It's good. Let's see you again. <laughs> you know, that's Kevin Sorbo and Rick Schroeder. Uh, you know, this stuff is happening all over. It's happening a, a, a lot. People trying to break through. Obviously, the Daily Wire, a big, big part of it. And everything and in, in what I'm doing in my publishing life, a big part of it. All of these things are real. They're happening. And if uh, you support them and if you enjoy them and like them, They'll grow. That's the way it works. And uh, if that will also be true if you come to the Andrew Claven show on Friday. I, too, will grow even more enormous than I am right at this moment. So I'll see you there.